Greetings fellow readers and happy holidays. This is Rambling Collector here and we are back with a very big video for you all today. So, I know it's been a while since I've posted anything new for a while, and I apologize for that. The whole holiday stresses, I think you understand. So, with that being said though, I wanted to do a special presentation, but also a bit of a gift from me to all of you. I am here today to read to you all four classic Christmas stories, those being A Charlie Brown Christmas, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, The Polar Express, and, last but most surely not least, The Night Before Christmas. And if you like any of these four stories, feel free to stay tuned, and feel free to just sit back, relax with a cup of hot chocolate, a hot cup of coffee, or whatever suits your needs. And let us enjoy, and we shall start with A Charlie Brown Christmas. It's the most magical time of the year. Christmas is coming. The air is crisp and cold. Children are ice skating, and the sound of Christmas carols fills the air. Everyone is in the holiday spirit. Well, almost everyone. I think there must be something wrong with me, Charlie Brown says. Christmas is coming, but I'm not happy. I like getting presents, sending cards, decorating trees and all that, but I always end up feeling sad. Charlie Brown, you're the only person I know who can take a wonderful season like Christmas and turn it into a problem, Linus says. Maybe Lucy's right. Of all the Charlie Browns in the world, you're the Charlie Browniest. Charlie Brown decides to talk to Lucy. She gives really good advice, and it only costs five cents. I just don't understand Christmas, Charlie Brown tells her. Instead of feeling happy, I feel sort of let down. You need to get involved in a real Christmas project, Lucy advises. How would you like to be the director of our Christmas play? Me? A director? Charlie Brown is surprised at the suggestion. He knows nothing about directing, but it sounds exciting. He agrees to meet Lucy at the school auditorium. On his way to the auditorium, Charlie Brown spots his dog, Snoopy, carrying a box of Christmas ornaments and lights. He watches as Snoopy carefully decorates his doghouse. Snoopy has entered a contest to win money for the best neighborhood Christmas lights and display. My own dog has gone commercial, Charlie Brown groans. I can't stand it. Next, Charlie Brown is stopped by his sister, Sally. Will you help me write a letter to Santa Claus, big brother? Sally asks. Charlie Brown begins to write down everything Sally says. Dear Santa Claus, Sally starts, how have you been? I have been extra good this year, so I have a long list of presents, but you can make it easy on yourself. Just send money. How about tens and twenties? Charlie Brown sighs. Good grief. When Charlie Brown finally arrives at the auditorium, the cast is waiting for him. Okay, let's have quiet, he announces. Places, everybody. Action. But no one listens to him. Schroeder starts playing his piano and everyone starts dancing. Nobody cares that Charlie Brown is directing. Nobody cares about the play. They just want to dance. Charlie Brown feels even worse than he did before. This Christmas play is all wrong, he moans. Lucy tries to make him feel better. Everybody knows Christmas is just a time of year for people to buy stuff, she says. But Charlie Brown disagrees. This is one play that is going to be different. We need something to set the proper mood. We need a Christmas tree. That's it, Lucy exclaims. We need a Christmas tree. A great big shiny aluminum tree. You go get the tree, Charlie Brown. I'll take Linus with me, Charlie Brown says. The rest of you can practice your lines. Lucy is excited about the Christmas tree. Get the biggest aluminum tree you can find, she orders. Maybe paint it pink. When Charlie Brown and Linus arrive at the Christmas tree lot, they are surrounded by fake trees. Some are plastic. Some are aluminum. Some are painted different colors. Some even have polka dots. Linus knocks on one of the aluminum trees. Do they still make wooden Christmas trees, he wonders out loud. Meanwhile, Charlie Brown is starting to feel sad again. None of these trees feel right to him. Then Charlie Brown sees it, a teeny tiny green tree. He smiles. This little tree seems to need a home, he says. Linus hesitates. I don't know, Charlie Brown. This doesn't seem to fit the modern spirit. But Charlie Brown suddenly feels better than he has in days. We'll decorate it, and it'll be just right for our play. Besides, I think it needs me. He picks up the tree. 
Needles tinkle as they fall off the scrawny tree, making it even scrawnier. Charlie Brown is still smiling when he returns to the auditorium. He gently places the tree down on Schroeder's piano. We're back, he announces. Everyone rushes over to see the tree. They are shocked and disappointed at Charlie Brown's choice. You were supposed to get a good tree, Lucy declares. Can't you even tell a good tree from a poor tree? Everyone agrees. What happens next is worst of all. Everybody starts to laugh at Charlie Brown and the little tree, even Snoopy. Charlie Brown feels sadder than ever. He turns to Linus. I guess you were right, he says. I shouldn't have picked this little tree. I really don't know what Christmas is all about. He pauses and looks around. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? He cries. To his surprise, it is Linus who answers. Sure, Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. He walks to the center of the stage and says, Lights, please? Somebody dims the lights in the auditorium and puts a single spotlight on Linus. In a clear voice, Linus begins to speak. And there were shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord came upon them and said, Fear not. For behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, for unto you is born this day a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God, peace on earth, good will to men. Everyone is quiet as Linus finishes. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown, he says. Charlie Brown picks up his little tree and steps outside. He looks up at the dark sky full of twinkling stars. He finally feels happy deep down inside, the way Christmas is supposed to make you feel. Linus is right, he says to himself. I'm not going to let everyone else's greed spoil my Christmas. I'll take this little tree home and decorate it and show everyone it really will work in our play. Charlie Brown passes Snoopy's fully decorated doghouse. Snoopy won first prize. He takes a shiny red ornament off the doghouse and hangs it on the little tree. But the ornament is too heavy and the little tree topples over. Charlie Brown is horrified. I've killed it, he cries. Everything I touch gets ruined. He walks away sadly with his head down, leaving the little tree alone. After Charlie Brown leaves, the others find the tree. I never thought it was such a bad little tree, Linus says. He wraps his blanket around the little tree's base. It's not bad at all, really. All it needs is a little love. Without saying a word, the other kids begin taking the decorations off of Snoopy's doghouse and putting them on the tree. It doesn't take long for them to transform the little tree into something magical. When Charlie Brown returns a few minutes later, he can scarcely believe his eyes. First he looks at Snoopy's bare doghouse, then at the beautiful tree. What's going on here? he asks. Then he looks at his friends. Their faces are all shining with joy. Merry Christmas, Charlie Brown, they shout. And before Charlie Brown can say another word, they start to sing Christmas carols. Charlie Brown smiles and starts singing with his friends. He knows it is going to be the best Christmas ever. And now, we move on to How the Grinch Stole Christmas. First. All right. Every who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot, but the Grinch, who lived just north of Whoville, did not. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Now please don't ask why, no one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. But whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve, hating the Who's, staring down from his cave with a sour, grinchy frown at the warm-lighted windows below in their town, for he knew every Who down in Whoville beneath was busy now hanging a mistletoe wreath. And they're hanging their stockings, he snarled with a sneer, Tomorrow is Christmas. It's practically here. Then he growled with his Grinch fingers nervously drumming. I must find some way to stop Christmas from coming, for tomorrow he knew. 
All the Who girls and boys would wake bright and early. They'd rush for their toys, and then, oh, the noise. Oh, the noise, 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 noise. That's one thing he hated. The noise, 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 noise. Then the Who's, young and old, would sit down to a feast, and they'd feast, and they'd feast, and they'd feast, 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 feast. They would feast on Who pudding and rare Who roast beast, which was something the Grinch couldn't stand in the least. And then they'd do something he liked least of all. Every Who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, would stand close together, with Christmas bells ringing, they'd stand hand in hand, and the Who's would start singing. They'd sing, and they'd sing, and they'd sing, 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 sing. And the more the Grinch thought of this Who Christmas sing, the more the Grinch thought, I must stop this whole thing. Why, for fifty-three years I've put up with it now. I must stop this Christmas from coming. But how? Then he got an idea, an awful idea. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. I know just what to do, the Grinch laughed in his throat, and he made a quick Santa Claus hat and a coat, and he chuckled and clucked, what a great Grinchy trick. With this coat and this hat, I look just like Saint Nick. All I need is a reindeer. The Grinch looked around, but since reindeer are scarce, there was none to be found. Did that stop the old Grinch? No. The Grinch simply said, If I can't find a reindeer, I'll make one instead. So he called his dog Max, then he took some red thread, and he tied a big horn on the top of his head. Then he loaded some bags and some old empty sacks on a ramshackle sleigh, and he hitched up old Max. Then the Grinch said, Get up! And the sleigh started down toward the homes where the Who's lay a snooze in their town. All their windows were dark, quiet snow filled the air, all the Who's were all dreaming sweet dreams without care, when he came to the first little house on the square. This is stop number one, the old Grinchy Claws hissed, and he climbed to the roof, empty bags in his fists. Then he slid down the chimney, a rather tight pinch, but if Santa could do it, then so could the Grinch. He got stuck only once, for a moment or two, then he stuck his head out of the fireplace flue, where the little who stockings all hung in a row. These stockings, he grinned, are the first things to go. Then he slithered and slunk with a smile most unpleasant. Around the whole room, and he took every present. Popcorns and bicycles, roller skates, drums, checkerboards, tricycles, popcorn and plums. And he stuffed them in bags, then the Grinch very nimbly stuffed all the bags one by one up the chimney. Then he slunk to the ice box. He took the Who's feast. He took the Who pudding. He took the roast beast. He cleaned out that ice box as quick as a flash. Why, that Grinch even took their last can of Who hash. Then he stuffed all the food up the chimney with glee, and now, grinned the Grinch, I will stuff up the tree. And the Grinch grabbed the tree, and he started to shove, when he heard a small sound like the coo of a dove. He turned around fast, and he saw a small who, little Cindy Lou who, who was not more than two. The Grinch had been caught by this tiny who daughter, who'd got out of bed for a cup of cold water. She stared at the Grinch and said, Santa Claus, why? Why are you taking our Christmas tree? Why? But you know that old Grinch was so smart and so slick, he thought up a lie and he thought it up quick. Why, my sweet little Todd, the fake Santa Claus lied, there's a light on this tree that won't light on one side. So I'm taking it home to my workshop, my dear. I'll fix it up there, then I'll bring it back here. And his fib fooled the child. Then he patted her head, and he got her a drink, and he sent her to bed. And when Cindy Lou Who went to bed with her cup, he went to the chimney and stuffed the tree up. Then the last thing he took was the log for their fire. 
Then he went up the chimney himself, the old liar. On their walls he left nothing but hooks and some wire. And the one speck of food that he left in the house was a crumb that was even too small for a mouse. And he did the same thing to the other whose houses, leaving crumbs much too small for the other whose mouses. It was quarter past dawn, all the who's still abed, all the who's still a snooze, when he packed up his sled, packed it up with their presents, the ribbons, the wrappings, the tags and the tinsel, the trimmings, the trappings. Three thousand feet up, up the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode with his load to the tip-top to dump it. Poo, poo to the who's, he was grinchishly, he humming. They're finding out now that no Christmas is coming. They're just waking up. I just kn know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two. Then the Who's down in Whoville will all cry boo-hoo. That's a noise, grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. So he paused, and the Grinch put his hand to his ear. And he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low... Then it started to grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why, this sound sounded merry. It couldn't be so. But it was merry. Very. He stared down at Whoville. The Grinch popped his eyes. Then he shook. What he saw was a shocking surprise. Every Who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say, that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light, and he brought back the toys and the food for the feast. And he... He himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast. And now, we should move on to my personal favorite, the Polder Express. Christmas Eve, many years ago, I lay quietly in my bed. I did not rustle the sheets. I breathed slowly and silently. I was listening for a sound, a sound a friend had told me I'd never hear, the ringing bells of Santa's sleigh. There is no Santa, my friend had insisted, but I knew he was wrong. Late that night, I did hear sounds, though not of ringing bells. From outside came the sounds of hissing steam and squeaking metal. I looked through my window and saw a train standing perfectly still in front of my house. It was wrapped in an apron of steam. Snowflakes fell lightly around it. A conductor stood at the open door of one of the cars. He took a large pocket watch from his vest, then looked up at my window. I put on my slippers and robe. I tiptoed downstairs and out the door. All aboard, the conductor cried out. I ran up to him. Well, he said. Are you coming? Where? I asked. Why, to the North Pole, of course, was his answer. This is the Polar Express. I took his outstretched hand, and he pulled me aboard. The train was filled with other children, all in their pajamas and nightgowns. We sang Christmas carols and ate candies with nougat centers as white as snow. We drank hot cocoa as thick and rich as melted chocolate bars. Outside, the lights of towns and villages flickered in the distance as the Polar Express raced northward. Soon there were no more lights to be seen. 
We traveled through cold, dark forests where lean wolves roamed, and white-tailed rabbits hid from our train as it thundered through the quiet wilderness. We climbed mountains so high it seemed as if we would scrape the moon, but the Polar Express never slowed down. Faster and faster we ran along, rolling over peaks and through valleys like a car on a roller coaster. The mountains turned into hills, the hills to snow-covered plains. We crossed a barren desert of ice, the Great Polar Ice Cap. Lights appeared in the distance. They looked like the lights of a strange ocean liner sailing on a frozen sea. There, said the conductor, is the North Pole. The North Pole. It was a huge city standing alone at the top of the world, filled with factories where every Christmas toy was made. At first we saw no elves. They are gathering at the center of the city, the conductor told us. That is where Santa will give the first gift of Christmas. Who receives the first gift? we all asked. The conductor answered, He will choose one of you. Look, shouted one of the children, the elves. Outside, we saw hundreds of elves. As our train drew closer to the center of the North Pole, we slowed to a crawl, so crowded were the streets with Santa's helpers. When the Polar Express could go no further, we stopped and the conductor led us outside. We pressed through the crowd to the edge of a large open circle. In front of us stood Santa's sleigh. The reindeer were excited. They pranced and paced, ringing the silver sleigh bells that hung from their harnesses. It was a magical sound, like nothing I'd ever heard. Across the circle, the elves moved apart, and Santa Claus appeared. The elves cheered wildly. He marched over to us and, pointing to me, said, Let's have this fellow here. He jumped into his sleigh. The conductor handed me up. I sat on Santa's knee, and he asked, Now, what would you like for Christmas. I knew that I could have any gift I could imagine, but the thing I wanted most for Christmas was not inside Santa's giant bag. What I wanted, more than anything, was one silver bell from Santa's sleigh. When I asked, Santa smiled, then he gave me a hug and told an elf to cut a bell from a reindeer's harness. The elf tossed it up to Santa. He stood, holding the bell high above him, and called out, The first gift of Christmas! A clock struck midnight as the elves roared their approval. Santa handed the bell to me, and I put it in my bathrobe pocket. The conductor helped me down from the sleigh. Santa shouted out the reindeer's names and cracked his whip. His team charged forward and climbed into the air. Santa circled once above us, then disappeared in the cold, dark polar sky. As soon as we were back inside the Polar Express, the other children asked to see the bell. I reached into my pocket, but the only thing I felt was a hole. I had lost the silver bell from Santa Claus's sleigh. Let's hurry outside and look for it, one of the children said but the train gave a sudden lurch and started moving. We were on our way home. It broke my heart to lose the bell. When the train reached my house, I sadly left the other children. I stood at my doorway and waved goodbye. The conductor said something for the moving train, but I couldn't hear him. What? I yelled out. He cupped his hands around his mouth. Merry Christmas, he shouted. The Polar Express let out a loud blast from its whistle and sped away. On Christmas morning, my little sister Sarah and I opened our presents. When it looked as if everything had been unwrapped, Sarah found one last small box behind the tree. It had my name on it. Inside was the silver bell. There was a note. Found this on the seat of my sleigh. Fix that hole in your pocket. Signed, Mr. C. I shook the bell. It made the most beautiful sound my sister and I had ever heard. But my mother said, Oh, that's too bad. Yes, said my father. It's broken. 
When I'd shaken the bell, my parents had not heard a sound. At one time, most of my friends could hear the bell, but as years passed, it fell silent for all of them. Even Sarah found one Christmas that she could no longer hear its sweet sound. Though I've grown old, the bell still rings for me, as it does for all who truly believe. And now, finally, we reach our last book. That being the ever so classic, The Night Before Christmas. "'Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house "'not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. "'The stockings were hung by the chimney with care "'in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. "'The children were nestled all snug in their beds "'while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. "'And Mama in her kerchief and I in my cap "'had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap.' When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters, and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below, when what to my wandering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donder and Blitzen, to the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the housetop the coursers they flew, with the sleigh full of toys, and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur, from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and sh soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry, his cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk. In laying his finger aside of his nose, and giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew, like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, as he drove out of sight, Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Well, I hope you all enjoyed my little Christmas tale readings. And once again, thank you all for listening if you've made it this far. This has been Rambling Collector. I hope to see you all in the next video. And once again, happy holidays and Merry Christmas, my fellow readers. I hope you all have a happy holiday. I'll see you all in the next video.